Let's turn over to the book of Romans chapter 5. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to harmonize from Genesis to Revelations all in one hour. That's kind of what we're attempting. Of course, we aren't going to answer all these questions, but when I started understanding the grace of God, when I saw that Jesus has paid for all my sins and I knew that God wasn't angry at me anymore and that God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them, I got a revelation of this. I experienced an unconditional love of God. I knew by experience that God loved me totally independent of my performance. It had nothing to do with who I was and it had everything to do with who God was. God was just a merciful God. I knew that. But as I went back and studied the Word, did you know that there's a lot of things in the Bible that are contrary to that? I know some of you may think, how could you say that? Well, there's some things in the Bible. I won't go through a lot of detail on this, but like, for instance, 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah had uh, told the king that because he went and inquired about Baalzebub and asked whether he was going to live or die, because he didn't turn to God, God was going to kill him. That doesn't look real consistent with God having paid for the sins of the whole world. And so the king got mad at Elijah and sent his armies out there to take him. So he sent a captain with 50 people and they went out and said, The king has said, O thou man of God, come down. And he said, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And the fire of God fell from heaven and killed 51 men. And so the king sent another man and his 50 soldiers with him. And he says, the king has said, come down quickly. And he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. So the fire of God, it says in 2 Kings chapter 1, fell and consumed this man and his 50. That's, that's 102 people killed. Finally, the third captain went out and had enough sense to say, hey, have mercy on me. I'm just doing what the king told me to do. And the Lord told Elijah, he says, go with him and I'll protect you. And he did. And he spoke to the king and everything was cool. Did you know what? He didn't have to kill those 102 men. He just, I mean, here's a prophet of God saying, 102 people dead. And you know what? People want to emulate these kind of things. When you say that you're called to be a prophet, that's what most people want to be. I'm a hellfire and damnation prophet, man. I mean the fire of God. I'm going to point like like Moses did and let the earth open up and swallow 250 people into the earth and then close upon them. And that's the way that people want to be. And so what I'm saying is there's things in the Bible that look contrary to that God, the war is over and that God's at peace with us. And so I had a conflict between these two. And I'm not going to turn over there because I'll preach on it if I do. But in Luke chapter 9, verse 52 and following, you find that Jesus was walking along with his disciples and the people in Samaria wouldn't receive him specifically because his face was set to go to Jerusalem. And the people, the Jews in Jerusalem hated the Samaritans because they were a mixed race and they had perverted the true worship of God, a racial and religious prejudice, the two strongest prejudices known to man. And when they saw that Jesus, they had already accepted Jesus. The whole city of Sychar had believed on Jesus with the woman at the well. She shared and the whole city got born again. And yet when they saw that he was headed to Jerusalem to worship with those hypocritical Jews in Jerusalem, they wouldn't even let him into the city. They totally snubbed and rejected Jesus. And when James and John, the sons of thunder, saw that, They wanted to call fire down out of heaven. They said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down out of heaven the way that Elijah did? They were emulating the Old Testament prophet. What could be wrong with wanting to be like Elijah? Jesus turned around and he rebuked them and says, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. And he says, the son of man didn't come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. Did you know Jesus rebuked James and John for wanting to do what Elijah did? You could say it this way, that if Jesus would have been on the earth in his physical ministry back in those days, he would have rebuked Elijah for calling fire down out of heaven. That never was God's best. That is not a true representation of God. And yet, it was appropriate at the time under the old covenant. There is a difference between the way God dealt with mankind under the old covenant and the way he deals with them under the new covenant. And if you try and go back and act like an old covenant man and relate to God the way the old covenant man do, then no wonder you feel the wrath of God and that you're afraid God is going to judge you and separate 
from you because of sin in your life because those kind of things happened under the Old Testament. So how do you harmonize this? Is God schizophrenic? Is there a God of the Old Testament and then did He change His mind and get converted in the New Testament and now He's different or something? No, God's the same all of the time. So how do you harmonize this wrath that you see under the Old Covenant with the mercy that you see under the New Covenant? Well, that's what I want to try and do today is to share with you something that will help you to harmonize this and understand the true nature of God. And I tell you, this will really help you. In Romans chapter 5, I wish I had time to put all of this in its context, but let's just jump down to verse 13. Romans chapter 5, verse 13. This is a parenthetical phrase. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now that, for me, is a pivotal scripture that helped me to understand the entire Bible. This is a major passage of scripture. It says, until the law, that's during the time of Moses. In the time of Moses, the law was given, I forget the exact date right now, but it was somewhere around 1,800 years after the fall of Adam. Uh, it, let's just say it was 2,000 years after the fall of Adam. Until, those, until 2,000 years after the fall of Adam... The law wasn't given, and until that time, God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them. The word impute is an accounting term. It's like if you were to go into a store and say, just put that on my tab, charge that to my account. Well, if they put it down and write it down, then they imputed that debt unto you, and at the end of the month, you have to go and settle up. If they never wrote it down, well, then it wasn't imputed unto you is what that's talking about. It means to put on account or put on the books. And so this is saying that until the time that the law was given, man sinned, but God wasn't imputing or holding man's sins against them until the time of the law. Now that is a major, major, major piece of information because basically, again, our religious system has taught us that God is this holy, stern, austere God that cannot tolerate sin. And it is just, I mean, he's angry. And I actually had one man come and describe to me that he saw God leaning over a rail of heaven with a lightning bolt in his hand just waiting on him to get out of line. And boom, he was throwing and judging people and doing things. And there's a lot of people that that's their impression of God. And religion has taught us that when mankind sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, God instantly cast Adam and Eve out of his presence because he couldn't stand to put up with Adam and Eve anymore with man. And the wrath of God instantly was vented upon the uh, earth. That is not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that until the time of Moses, God wasn't holding men's sins against them, wasn't imputing their sins unto them. So what this is saying is God was a merciful God and He didn't instantly start judging man's sins and bringing punishment on man's sin. He was actually operating in mercy towards men for nearly the first 2,000 years of existence. Then the law was given and the law was in effect for 2,000 years until the time that Christ came. But then again in John chapter 1 it says the law and the prophets were until John and since that time, the kingdom of heaven is preached and all men press unto it. And it says that Jesus came to end the law. Galatians chapter 3 says the law was only temporary. So we've basically been, uh, I've actually added this up and it's 5,900 and I think it's 35 or 65 years since the fall of Adam. And did you know that during that span of time, there's only 2,000 out of those nearly 6,000 years that mankind has actually been under the law and has had sin imputed unto them. The first 2,000 years, God was dealing in mercy with people. And since the time of Christ, the law has ceased to be the way God deals with people. He's not imputing sins to them again, except the church has come along and has been proclaiming that God is still imputing men's sins to them. So even though we've been out from under the law for 2,000 years, most people don't know it. Most Christians are still living under the law. Those are some radical things. Look over in Genesis chapter 3. And let me just go back to the beginning and show you some things here. Remember this passage that we started with, Romans 5, 13. 
says, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. In the third chapter of Genesis, we find where Adam and Eve sinned against God and transgressed. And down in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now notice it says in verse 22, The Lord said, Man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden. The word therefore means that that 22nd, 23rd verse is dependent upon what was said in the 22nd verse. The reason God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden was so they wouldn't eat of the tree of life and live forever. It did not say that the reason God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden was because now God was holy and holy God could have no communion and no fellowship with unholy man. That has been what has been preached and proclaimed that As long as there is any sin, any impurity in our life, a holy God cannot have anything to do with us. That's not what this says. God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden specifically so they wouldn't eat of the tree of life and live forever. And then in the fourth chapter, I'm going to go through this more in just a minute, but in the fourth chapter, you find God still walking and talking with man. He's still talking to them in an audible voice. He's still fellowshipping with them. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 16, it says that Cain left the presence of God. God didn't take his presence away from man. Man left the presence of God. We walked away from God. God didn't cast us away from his presence. He didn't quit fellowshipping with man. God was still dealing with mankind in mercy, not imputing their sins unto them until the time of the law. So why did he drive them out of the Garden of Eden? So they wouldn't take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And I'm going to have to read some things into this. This is andeology if you want to take it that way. But I believe that the reason God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden is because if they would have taken of the tree of life and have eaten it and lived forever in a sinful state, that wouldn't have been good. That would have been terrible. I don't know if any of you ever saw this movie, um, what was that, Tuck Everlasting. Anybody ever see that movie? A few of you shaking your head. I like that movie. I thought it was awesome. And anyway, one of the, they, they drank this uh, water that's supposed to make you live forever. And so these people were two and three hundred years old. They couldn't die. You shoot them and they live and anyway... It, And uh, in this movie, there was a bad guy in there that tried to drink of this water. And if he would have drunk of that water, it would have been impossible to get rid of him. And he was just pure evil. And anyway, you saw through that a number of things that, you know what? Because we live in a sinful world, death is actually a blessing. It's a blessing to the human race as a whole because if, if you couldn't die, if there was no consequences and if there was no such thing as... Uh, a person dying, then all of the evil, all the Hitlers of the whole human race would still be alive spewing out that poison. Did you know death ends a lot of things? And what would it have been like to live in a fallen world where you couldn't die? You have birth defects. You have retardation. You have all of these terrible things that hit people. You have all of these sicknesses and diseases, somebody with emphysema, somebody that's in a wheelchair, somebody who's handicapped. There would never be any escape from it. You would live forever in this corrupted, sinful state. You would live forever in a place where there's just lying and cheating and stealing and all of these kind of things. You know what? It is really a benefit. God knew that living forever in sin is not what He intended for His people. And so death is actually a positive thing if you know the Lord because we get ushered into a different uh, kingdom where everything's going to be perfect, no more sorrow, crying, or anything like this. And I believe that the Lord saw that, didn't want people living forever in a corrupted state, and therefore death is actually a blessing. He didn't want Adam and Eve to eat of that tree and have the ability to live forever in corruption and in sin. 
It was actually an act of love that God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, not an act of rejection. It wasn't him that quit fellowshipping with people. And you can see that in the fourth chapter. In the fourth chapter, it talks about Adam and Eve having Cain and Abel. And it says in verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of, his, uh, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. Now there's a lot of things that are subtle here that you have to think about. Most people just read through this and don't think about it. But let me ask you this. How did Cain and Abel know that they were supposed to offer sacrifices? Some people just don't think about this stuff. Where did they get this knowledge? Was it just intuitive? Did they automatically know these things? Were they born with this knowledge of sacrifice and all this kind of stuff? The scripture doesn't explain it, but it does talk about right here in the context that God spoke in an audible voice to Cain and unto Abel. There's no reason to believe that this was anything except the same thing that was going on in the Garden of Eden. God was walking and talking with them. There was an audible voice. That would be the obvious interpretation because that's the context before and after it. If you would stop and think about it, God was still talking with these people. They were hearing from God. What's the difference between being in the garden and being out here? God was still walking with them. God was still talking with them. How did, how did they know that God approved of Abel's offering and disapproved of Cain's offering? Scripture doesn't say, but again, there is either a visible or an audible manifestation of God, something that showed acceptance and rejection. And some people say that the reason Cain's offering was rejected because it didn't have blood in it. And I admit that a blood sacrifice is the one that's typical of Jesus, but there were also sacrifices commanded to offer of your first fruits and to bring them before the Lord. And he did exactly what was later revealed nearly 2,000 years later about bringing the first fruits of your crops and things like this. You know, the scripture says over in Hebrews chapter 11 that it was faith that made Abel's offering accepted and Cain's rejected. I don't think it was the substance. I don't think that they missed the substance. Again, I can understand the logic and the symbolism, but it doesn't say that here. I believe that later they are commanded to offer the first fruits. Where did he get this knowledge about bringing these sacrifices and doing all of this? It would appear that God was still walking and talking and communicating with man. God was still fellowshipping with men, not imputing their sins unto them. And he had respect unto Abel's offering, but not unto Cain's. There was some visible or audible way that he showed respect for these offerings. And so it said in verse um, 6, or in verse 5, it says, But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain... Now again, there is no indication that they had a spirit that was in communion with God and that this was just an intuitive thing, it would appear from the context that this is God speaking in an audible voice unto him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you wroth and why is thy countenance falling? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Here's God talking to Cain in an audible voice, the same way that he talked to Adam and Eve in the third chapter. And so in verse 8, Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, now here again is God talking to Cain, and it looks like that this is in an audible voice. He says, where is Abel thy brother? And look at Cain's reaction. He says, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? Now think about this. If you were the first murderer on the face of the earth... Now see, today I've heard a statistic that the average uh, teenager, by the time they graduate from high school, has seen in excess of 250,000 brutal murders on television and screen. And so, you know, from us today, it's totally different than it was back then. But they didn't have television. They had never seen a murder. There had never been a person on the face of the earth kill. This is the very first person to ever murder another person. And while he still had the blood on his hands, God speaks in an audible voice out of heaven and said, Where is Abel, your brother? Let me ask you this. If you were the first murderer, if you had just killed your brother, and if you heard an audible voice out of heaven saying, What have you done? 
What would happen to you? They wouldn't have to worry about prosecuting you. You'd probably drop dead right there. You'd just think, man, this is it. For Cain to respond the way he did and basically just put his hands behind his back and says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Just lie to an audible voice of God. This says volumes. It says that he was so used to the presence of God. He was so used to God talking to him. You know, familiarity breeds contempt. And so this shows you that God was still walking and talking with man. This whole concept that when Adam and Eve sinned, there was immediate rejection by God is not the truth. God was extending mercy towards man and still dealing with them in love and compassion. He was still walking and talking with them. And as I said, down here in the 16th verse, it says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Cain is the one that left the presence of God. He couldn't stand to be in the presence of a holy God because his own conscience was condemning him and stuff. And so he left the presence of God. You can't leave something you don't have. The presence of God had to be with them. God was walking with man and still being merciful to them and he did not impute man's sins unto them during those first 2,000 years. Just for time's sake, I'm going to just quote some of these things to you. But Abraham, if you were to turn over to Leviticus chapter 18, it was a sin to marry a half-sister. Abraham married his half-sister. And according to Leviticus 18, it's an abomination and you had to kill those people, stone them to death if they married a half-sister. Abraham was living in a sexual abomination to God. When do you think God decided it was wrong to marry a half-sister? It wasn't communicated until the law came, but you know what? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't believe God ever intended all those kind of things. But Abraham married his half-sister, and instead of God punishing him, God made him the friend of God and dealt with him in mercy. And then Abraham lied and was going to let the king, Pharaoh, and King Abimelech two times. He didn't just do this once, twice. He was going to let somebody else commit adultery with his wife to protect his own neck. Did you know what? Any way you want to slice that, that's wrong. That's just wrong. That is not integrity. If I was to do that, if I was, say, to go over to a country and all of a sudden they liked Jamie and said, man, I like her and I thought that they were going to kill me to get to her. And I said, I've never seen this lady before. Help yourself. I guarantee you that would be a scandal. I'd be criticized and rightfully so if I did that. It was wrong on Abraham's part and yet God blessed him and rebuked the king as if the king was the one that was wrong. You know why? Because Abraham had a covenant with God and the king didn't. God deals with people based on covenants, not based on who's right and who's wrong. Amen. He protected Abraham. And then you find Abraham's children coming along and Jacob married two sisters, Rachel and Leah. Or was it Rebecca? Was it Rachel? Rachel and Leah, they both got uh, married to Jacob while the sister was still alive. According to Leviticus 18, that's an abomination. You have to kill somebody that does that kind of stuff. And yet God wrestled with him and he prevailed with God and he became uh, Israel and the children of Israel were named after him. And on and on and on and on you could go. Did you know God was dealing with people in mercy? If the law would have been given, they would have been under the wrath and the punishment of God. But prior to the law, you find God dealing with people in mercy, not imputing their sins unto them. Take, for instance, Cain right here in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. When this happened, when he killed his brother, and then he lied to God about it, covered it up, there wasn't repentance on his part. He wasn't sorry. He was sorry he got caught, but he wasn't sorry. He didn't repent. And what did God do to him? He, he, Cain told God, he says, I'm afraid people are going to hear about this and everybody who hears about it is going to seek to kill me. And so God put a mark in his forehead and he said, if anybody touches Cain, I'll avenge him sevenfold. God protected the first murderer on the face of the earth. Instead of judging him and killing him and doing something to him, God extended mer- mercy to the first murderer. The first person who broke the law was in, uh, where was this, Exodus 16. I think the person went out to pick up sticks on the Sabbath day. The first person who ever broke the commandment of Moses was a man who was just gathering sticks so that he could fix a fire 
and cook some food. And because he broke the law about the Sabbath day, they shut him up until they could hear what God wanted to do. And God appeared in a visible form and then in an audible voice spoke out of the cloud and said, kill him, show him no mercy. Under the law, the first person to violate the law was killed for picking up sticks to make a fire. The first person who transgressed after the fall of Adam and Eve killed his brother and God extended mercy towards him. Man, can't you see that there is a difference in God dealing with people when before the law and after the law? The law was not really God's true heart. If God really was as ticked off as people have presented Him and as the law sometimes makes it look, then God would have just started judging people. He would have let Cain have it. He would have killed him. He would have done some of these things. But instead, you see mercy extended towards people. You know, I hate to even bring this up, but somebody's thinking this, and so save me answering questions later. But there are two notable exceptions to this which is the destruction of the earth with the flood during the days of Noah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained fire and brimstone down. And some people say, well, that was before the law and that certainly was the wrath of God. And I agree it was. But here's the way I reconcile this. Again, I'm going back to Romans 5, 13. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin isn't imputed where there is no law. As a general rule, God wasn't holding men's sins against them. He was dealing in mercy with people prior to the time the law came, with these two exceptions. And actually, I believe that in those cases, it was certainly an act of of judgment and imputing people's sins unto them for those who received the destruction. But if you look at the human race as a whole, it was an act of mercy. It would be, for instance, like a person who's got an infection or something in their arm or in their leg and this infection is beginning to spread and you can't stop the infection. The only thing you can do is just lop off a leg or cut off an arm. It's terrible judgment on that individual member, but on the body as a whole, you're trying to preserve the life of the entire body. And this is the way I see it. During the days of uh, Noah, when he destroyed the earth with the flood, all except for eight people, and during the time of uh, Lot, when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it was like there was a cancer in the earth, and people couldn't be born again. They couldn't be purged and cleansed of this. These people were so demonic. And I could go into a lot of detail on that, but the Bible says that we are just now, as it is, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. We are just now beginning to come back to a time that even approaches how bad it was in those days. So when you look at all of the corruption, the sin, the gay people having parades and bragging and promoting it and flaunting their sexual immorality that is an abomination to God. It isn't as bad now as it was back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was so bad. There was like a cancer in the earth that if God hadn't have destroyed those people, there wouldn't have been a virgin left for him to fulfill his promise through. And that's not an exaggeration. That is how corrupt the earth was becoming. So you could say, well, that was judgment. That's God holding people's sins against them. But actually, I think it was on the nation, on the uh, human race as a whole, it was an act of mercy. It was God cutting out a cancer, trying to keep that corruption from escalating to a point that it would just defile the entire human race. As a whole, I believe Romans 5, 13, that God was not holding men's sins against them. He was being merciful unto people. And so you find a mercy and a grace extended towards people and God using people who were doing things that later was proven to be totally against His will and yet He used those people and blessed them. There was mercy extended towards people. But then the law came and the law began to start holding people's sins against them. Now here's a couple of reasons why God did that. And I'm just going to paraphrase. Again, I'm talking as fast as I can. I've got a long ways to go. We're covering all the way from Genesis to Revelations. Amen. So get the tape. Go back and study this or write the scriptures down. But in Galatians chapter 3, it says over there that the law was like a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It says the law shut us up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. But now that Christ has come, we're no longer under this schoolmaster. The law was only temporary. And here's the way that I look at it. It's like a little child. 
You know, when they're one year old, you have to tell the children right and wrong. And you have to get them, you have to start establishing patterns of them choosing the good things and rejecting the bad. And yet, a one year old doesn't have the ability to comprehend everything. You can't just sit down and reason with a one year old and explain things to them. And yet, you still have to get them to obey. I could get plumb off the subject right here. Or I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing that because I got other things to say. But anyway, you have to uh, you have to get a child to just get to where they obey you, not because they understand what's going on, but just basically out of fear. You do that again, and I'm going to spank you. See, if you try and sit down to a one-year-old and reason and say, now look, if you go over there and take that toy from your brother or your sister, then you're responding to the devil. The devil is a taker and not a giver. The Lord says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So you know what? You're yielding yourself to Satan and you're establishing a bad pattern and you're never going to have friends because you're only a selfish person. People don't like selfish people. You're never going to be able to hold a job because if you get a job, all it's going to be is about yourself. You're never going to, your marriage is going to fail if you continue in this selfishness. You know what? You try and explain all that to a one-year-old and they just look at you. They can't comprehend that. But you know what you can do to a one-year-old is say, you take that toy again and I'm going to spank you. And they may not even know there is a God or devil, heaven or hell, but when they feel this desire to go take a toy, they'll say no because they know they're going to be punished for it. So until they get old enough to understand, you can actually through fear get a person to do the right thing. And there is benefit to that. I remember our oldest son, Joshua, he was just about one or two years old and we were walking out in the country on a dirt road and the uh, weeds were up, you know, I don't know, four or five feet high and he was just a little tiny kid and he was running nearly as far in front of us as from here to the back of this room. And we were walking down this dirt road. Nobody ever came down this dirt road. But there was a crossroad and somebody was going 60 miles an hour out there and they were coming so fast that, you know what, I couldn't have run and have gotten Joshua and have stopped him. And Joshua reached that intersection at the exact moment that this car going 60 miles an hour, and the weeds were up, they couldn't see Joshua. So anyway, they were on a collision course. But because we had been training him and disciplining him and told him to obey us, and if he didn't obey us, he got a spanking, Joshua was running ahead of us. I just said, Joshua, stop. And I mean, right mid-stride, he just boing like this. <laughs> he stopped in that car, just shoo, right on by. You know what? There's a lot of people that don't discipline their kids. They just think they ought to reason with them. And because of that, you're, you're making that child susceptible. They've got to learn to do what's right long before they reason. And uh, so anyway, you, the Lord, before we could get born again... The scripture says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. A person before you're born again just doesn't have the capacity to understand spiritual things. And so what, how could God restrict the amount of sin? How could God get us pointed in the right direction and doing the right thing even though we didn't have the capacity for spiritual understanding before you got born again? Well, it's real simple. He just says, do that again and I'll kill you. Pick up sticks on the Sabbath day and you're dead. Do this and man, you're hit with the botch, the mildew, the emrods. You just go out and strike people with plagues and do this and do this. And you know what? It taught people right and wrong. But it was motivated out of fear. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that whoever fears has not been made perfect in love because fear has torment. Perfect love will cast out fear. And in the new covenant, we aren't supposed to be serving God out of fear of punishment. But you know what? Most people have not learned the new covenant thing. They are still operating under the old covenant deal of fear. And they are afraid that God is angry at them and that God is imputing sin unto them. And it needs to be a change. That was only a temporary way of God dealing with us until we could get born again. And now that we're born again... There is an intuitive knowledge. God is in there leading us and telling us right and wrong. And you don't have to fear the wrath and the judgment of God. You know, I grew up in a place where there was a busy city street. 
My dad died when I was a young kid, and so my mother raised me, and my mother beat me within an inch of my life, amen, if I ever crossed that street without looking both ways. I mean, I got a lot of whippings over that. And so, uh, you know, here I am, I'll be 57 in April, and to this day, when I cross the street, I'll look both ways two or three different times. I mean, I just had it drilled into me to look both ways before you cross the street. But now I understand that it's not the fact that my mom's going to give me a whipping that causes me to do this. Now I've gone beyond that and I do what's right, not because I'm going to get in trouble from my mom, but because I don't get hit by a car. There's another reason. There's another motivation for it. You know, my mother just turned 93 in January. And if I was to walk across the street and if I was talking to you and if I forgot what I was doing and if I didn't, Look both ways, and I got to the other side of the street and realized, oh no, I didn't look both ways. Please don't tell my mom. Please don't tell my mother that I did this. She'll beat me within an inch of my life. You know, if I was to respond that way, you'd look at me and think, something's wrong with you. <laughs> my mom's 93. If I had to, I could take her. Praise <laughs> God. I don't have to be afraid of my mother beating me. But I still do what's right, but now I do it with a totally different motivation. And see, I'm not saying that we no longer do what's right, but the Old Testament law was a brief period of time until people could be born again that God used fear and wrath and punishment to motivate people, but it had the negative side effect of of fear has torment. And most people are tormented. They weren't able to enter into the closeness and relationship that God desired. And that's the reason that God didn't start imputing man's sins unto them from the very beginning. You know, if he wanted to just impute man's sins unto them, he could have taken Adam and Eve and sat them down and says, All right, let me show you what your transgression has just done. Let me show you what's going to happen in the human race. And he could have shown them just, you know, in, in this last century, Hitler... And the people that have been killed, the wars, the terrible things. If he was just just go down this front row of preachers over here and talk about the heartache and the hurt and the pain and the sickness and disease and anger and bitterness and all of these things, just of these people on the front row, I believe Adam probably couldn't have lived with himself. He wouldn't have been able to handle it. God could have shown him his wrath. God could have shown him how bad he was. But you know, the Lord didn't sit him down and say, all right, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not do this. Why didn't he give the Ten Commandments to Adam and Eve? He was talking to them in an audible voice. Seems like it would have been a great opportunity to do it. Why did he wait 2,000 years? Because the law never was God's best. God didn't want us to know the depths of our sin. He didn't want Adam to feel so bad that he ran from him. God extended mercy to people for 2,000 years. But they were taking his lack of judgment as approval. And you find in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis that after Cain got by with murder, Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, killed a man and he did it in self-defense. And so Lamech said, if Cain is going to be avenged sevenfold, surely Lamech is going to be avenged seventy and sevenfold. In other words, he says, I was more justified in my murder than what Cain was. So if God protected Cain, then God's got to protect me. And they begin to start comparing themselves among themselves. And they were getting to where it wasn't wrong to murder people. It wasn't wrong to commit adultery. Sodomy wasn't wrong. People were losing their standard of right and wrong. And God had to do something to impose a standard on people because they were comparing themselves among themselves measuring themselves by themselves. People didn't even know what was right and wrong anymore. Boy, we see this exact same thing happening in our society. Did you know 50 years ago, homosexuality was wrong? There was people that did it, but it was wrong. And even the people who did it knew it was wrong. And they didn't boast about it and brag about it. And they didn't have parades. And they didn't promote themselves as gay. If they uh, Certainly nobody would have even used that word to describe them. And now things, you know what? You find a few rock stars, a politician, a movie star who is homosexual and they had money and fame and acclaim and all of a sudden people feel differently about it now. You know, it's still as wrong as it ever was. But we find people, most people don't have an absolute standard. They don't have a, a established standard of right and wrong. It's just relative. 
Christians try and be a little bit better than the average in our society. We don't go by what the Word says as a whole. That's wrong. We ought to go by what God's Word says. But people are comparing themselves. So how did God break that? He established a standard that showed man the wrath of God and it made people, those of them who had a desire for God all of a sudden realize if this is what God is demanding, man, I'm in big trouble. And here's one of the main purposes of the law. Boy, you need to listen to this. If you get this, it'll really make a difference in the way you relate to God. One of the main purposes of the law wasn't to get you to keep everything presented in the law. Because if you really study the law, the law is very detailed. If you're wearing a garment today that has part polyester and part cotton in it, you broke the law. I mean, it's down to very specific things. Did you know (laughs) there were things in the law that told you how to go to the bathroom? It's true. There's a right and wrong way to go to the bathroom. The law had requirements for everything. Most of you don't even know that because we say, oh, I believe you've got to keep the law. I've had people come up to me and criticize me. I still believe we've got to keep the Ten Commandments. And I've asked them, so tell me what they are. And I have yet to have anybody tell me that you've got to keep the Ten Commandments that can give me all ten of the commandments. And there's a lot more than ten commandments. There's thousands and thousands of commandments about everything. You know, one of the reasons God gave that is for people who had been comparing themselves among themselves and thinking, you know, I'm really a pretty good person. I know I'm not everything I should be, but I'm a relatively good person. People who believe that God grades on a curve and that God, you know, has got to accept somebody. And so nobody's perfect, so it really doesn't matter whether you're perfect. It's just how are you in relation to everybody else? God's going to accept you if you're in the top 10 percentile. See, that's the way that a lot of people think. You know what God did for those who were thinking, well, I'm pretty good. I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. At least I'm not like this publican. I fast twice in the week and they compared themselves. God gave a standard that says, you think you're good enough? Let me show you what holiness is. And he gave a standard that nobody could keep. The law wasn't really given for you to keep. Now, there is benefit in keeping it to the degree that you can because it keeps Satan off of your back. So there is some benefit to keeping it, but nobody could ever keep the law except one. That was Jesus. But the law was given to give you such a standard that it would condemn you. And man, if I had more time, I could show you scriptures on this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse I think 56, the strength of sin is the law. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the law condemns, the law kills. The law makes sin come alive. Romans chapter 7, the law wasn't something that was given to help you. It was given to hurt you. It was given to beat you down. It was given to take away your self-righteousness and to condemn you and make you feel so unworthy that it would basically just knock you flat of your face and saying, God, if this is what you demand... I've got no chance. Have mercy on me, a sinner. It was to drive you to the mercy and to the grace of God. You know, this friend of mine, Dave Duell, tells a story about a guy that went to heaven and he was real smug because he was a very good man and the angel met him and says, well, what makes you worthy to come in here? And he says, oh, I'm really a good person. So he says, okay, let's uh, tell me what you've done. He says, you've got to have 100 points to get into heaven. So tell me what you've done and I'll evaluate you. So the guy says, well, man, I went to church every single Sunday. I had a church attendance award pin. I never missed. And he says, good, that's half a point. (laughs) And he says, half a point? And he says, well, man, I was faithful to my wife. I never cheated on her. He says, good, that's worth one point. And he said, well, I gave tithes. I paid tithes. And he says, that's worth one point. And he gave about four or five things. He had five points. And he says, man, at this rate, I can't get in unless it's by the grace of God. And the angel goes, bingo, amen. (laughs) That's the purpose of the law is for people who are thinking, I'm really pretty good. You know what? You can't get saved trusting in yourself and in your own goodness. And so God had to take away this self-righteousness and get you to recognize that you had to trust His mercy and His grace, not trust yourself. How did He do it? He gave you such a standard of one through 10,000 things that you had to do that the purpose of it was to make you despair of self-righteousness and get you out of thinking that you could be good enough and make us all guilty 
before God. Romans chapter 3, that's what the law does. It shuts your mouth and makes you guilty before God. It is one of the greatest deceptions that has ever been put forth in the world that the church has somehow or another embraced the law and said, God loved us so much He gave us step 1 through 10,000 to show you exactly what you've got to do to get right with Him. And it's made it a positive thing. The law was meant to kill. The law was meant to destroy. The law was meant to shut you up and make you hopeless and helpless so that you would cry out to God for mercy. And yet the church has embraced it and is wanting to promote it. Man, the law was not a positive thing. The law was given to kill us and all these things. And we need to get out from under the law. And we need to get to where we start relating to God just based on mercy. So for those first 2,000 years, God dealt with mankind in mercy. But when people began to take God's lack of judgment as approval, they lost their concept of right and wrong because they were comparing themselves among themselves. They were getting into self-righteousness, living ungodly and actually thinking that I'm just wonderful even though I've done all of these things. God had to bring an end to that. So he gave the law, started judging people's sins, punishing them. And what it did, it put fear in people. It limited the amount of sin, but it caused the sin that they had committed to just destroy them condemn them. People were living under condemnation. People weren't enjoying relationship with God. Jesus came to redeem us from that law and from the condemnation and now put us back to where we just love God and God's not imputing our sins unto us. I use those scriptures out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing man's sins unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then as as if we were ambassadors, we beseech you in Christ's stead to be you reconciled to God. God has given us this ministry of telling people God's not mad at you, He's not angry, He's not imputing your sins unto you. And it's the goodness of God. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that is leading men to God that leads us to repentance. Brothers and sisters, you've got to have enough discernment to know what was Old Testament law, why God gave the law, and to recognize it under the New Testament. We've got a better thing. We aren't under the law anymore. We're under the law of loving God and loving man. Those are the two laws, the two commandments that Jesus gave. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you would do those two things, you'll fulfill all of the concepts all of the things of the law and you'll do it better than living out of fear trying to pay it by debt and obligation. I don't know if this helped you, but these are things I had to get answered for me. I saw the grace and mercy of God in the New Testament. I saw the wrath of God in the Old Testament. I couldn't reconcile it and thought, is God schizophrenic? Has He changed? What has happened? God has always been the same. But just like we had to correct our children and for a period of time you'd swat them, you'd hit them with a spoon or whatever on the rear, that wasn't because you hated them. That's because you were trying to get them to do the right thing. They couldn't understand. And it was only a temporary way of dealing with them. But you know what? They become an adult and you have to just release them and you love them and you deal with them in a different manner. Well, now that we have been born again, God is not imputing our sins unto us. God is not going to get you. God's not punishing you. God's not the one that's causing problems in your life. And now you're free to relate to God just based on love. We got a new covenant, a better covenant. Amen. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. Christ redeemed us from the law. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I really love grace and I preach grace and all of this, but I spend probably most of my time in the Old Covenant studying. And people wonder, why do you do that? Because now that I've got this revelation, I look back at what I'm redeemed from and see that, you know... This was terrible and, and you can tell it was terrible because of the wrath and the punishment that God put on these people. And yet in the new covenant, I'm deserving of those kind of things and yet God is extending mercy towards me and it makes me love God. It makes me appreciate God. If you understand this properly, you can go back into the old covenant and you can get really blessed seeing what we are redeemed from and seeing thank you Jesus for the greater day that we live in today. I tell you, the body of Christ has just not been taking advantage of our new covenant. We've been living as old covenant people. 
We've been living as if Jesus hadn't come and set us free from all of these rituals and all of these legalistic things. And I tell you, it's, we just live in a great day and most of us haven't even got a revelation of the covenant that we've got. Hopefully this teaching this week is helping you to recognize that, man, we got a better covenant and we need to get into the Word of God and find out what all of our benefits are and, and take full advantage of them. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for these truths. And Father, I thank you that you have set us free from the law of sin and death getting punishment instead of blessing. Father, thank you that we don't get what we deserve. But thank you that through the mercy and the grace of Jesus, we get what he deserves. Father, I pray for people here today that haven't had this revelation. I believe that the Holy Spirit is taking these things and making the word clear to them and that, Father, they're going to get explanation so that they'll be able to walk in this. Father, I pray for anyone here today that doesn't know you personally, isn't born again, or doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I ask you, Father, that today you would draw those people to yourself and that they would receive this good news, this nearly too good to be true gospel. Father, we thank you for it. And we receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me ask if there's anybody here today that's not born again.